Good afternoon and welcome to the Mike Channel 6 Show. I am so happy to be back today. I was gone last Thursday. I went to a CPAC event and I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody. It's an interesting three days. In, actually, it was in Maryland, I think. I had some great crab cakes, by the way. I'm in the studio today with Vince. He might join us in the uh, part of the discussions here. He's in and out. Oh, that's nice for him to say. He said last week's show was very boring without me. Anyway, I've got a couple of great topics we're going to be talking about today. In fact, part of this has to do with my uh, my nice trip that I had up to Baltimore uh, this week. Um, I was honored to have been invited to participate uh, with a, uh, the launching of a new national group. And I think this ought to be really interesting for my audience. And I'm, In fact, I'm going to give out the, the, uh, the phone number because I hope this will generate a number of phone calls. Uh, we're going to talk about a new group called uh, Conservatives Concerned about the death penalty. It's a new national group, and it's a group that's basically inviting conservatives to take another look at uh, our uh, acceptance of the death penalty. Uh, I think it's it's fair to say that most people would uh, believe that if you were to ask, you know, what do conservatives believe on the death penalty, I think um, a lot of people would say, hey, they're for it. And I'm actually delighted that my experience at CPAC this week, or last week, uh, demonstrated that that may not be the case. And so we have with us on the program in the first part of the segment uh, a wonderful young lady called uh, Heather Bodwin, and she works for a group called Equal Justice USA, and it's a national grassroots organization working to build a criminal justice system that is fair, effective, and responsive to everyone impacted by crime. And she is also the advocacy coordinator for the new group called Conservatives Concerned about the Death Penalty. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a new group of political and social conservatives who question the alignment of capital punishment with conservative principles and values. And she has previously worked for Montana Abolition Coalition to End the Death Penalty, where she was responsible for outreach efforts to evangelicals, uh, conservatives, and law enforcement. And she also worked with uh, and she helped uh, with a Helena Pregnancy Resource Center the National Republican Congressional Committee in Washington, D.C., and Michigan Republican Senate Majority Leader Ken Sakima. I hope I got that right. And Heather graduated from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with a degree in political science, and she currently resides in Three Rivers, Michigan, with her husband, Matt, and their new five-month-old daughter. And I know she was really happy to get back home to her five-month-old daughter because she kept showing me all those beautiful pictures her husband was sending every morning. So we welcome on board Heather uh, Bodwin to talk about this new group. Heather, are you with us? I am. I am. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. Absolutely, Heather. Um, listen, uh, you know, this is a, a neat thing because, as you know, as I talked to you when we were actually at CPAC, I was kind of intimidated to come up there uh, and, and basically be a voice against or at least a voice concerned about the death penalty as a conservative because I thought we'd really be kind of clobbered. But sure. I was very surprised that we had such a positive reception. And I want you to start out, just briefly tell us a little bit about this new group. Uh, how it was founded, and what the goals are of conser conservatives concerned about the death penalty. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks again for having me, and, and it was a pleasure to, to be able to get to know you at CPAC and, and for you to join us there, so so thanks for coming along Absolutely. Us, um, as well. So, yes, conservatives concerned about the death penalty, as you said, is a, a new group. Um, it's a new national group. It's actually been around for a little while at the state level in Montana, um, where I pre previously worked, and we had folks there, including the the then um, ha House Majority Leader um, of the Montana House of Representatives, Roy Brown, who um, we were noticing that there was um, a need for a group like this, um, you know, folks who are conservative, who are interested in talking about the issue of the death penalty, and who are concerned and, and want to share those concerns with one another. And we had great success in Montana with getting a group together and wanted to launch this national group because... As you said, a lot of folks think that conservatives are in favor of the death penalty when, in fact, the, the vast majority of folks that we talked to at CPAC, which hundreds of people, um, you know, came up to us for different reasons and said, I'm so glad that there's a group like this in existence, right. and, and where have you been for so long? Um, so folks who are who are wanting to have this dialogue and who understand that the death penalty system isn't functioning um, adequately. Yeah, and the, uh, there was a New Republic article written, and someone sent it to me, and I was pleased to see that the New Republic reporter also, uh, independent of conservatives concerned, talked to a number of the attendees at CPAC and agreed that there is quite a bit of reception uh, uh -huh. to the idea that we ought to take another look at this and maybe uh, you know people that are uh, all about limited government 
uh, ought to right. really reconsider whether or not this is limited government or not. So even he agreed. Now, he did question whether it was politically uh, the right time and so forth. But, I mean, I think the, the general concession or the general um, uh, attitude of most people that were there was, look, you know, that's something we do need to take another look at. That's right. That's right. As conservatives, you know, we care about cost. And obviously, you know, the death penalty is an extremely expensive, um, you know, system and, and the way that it's functioning is, is is not working well. And so as conservatives, it's our responsibility to take a look at this and to not blindly follow along and, and just assume that it's working well. It's time for us to really reconsider. It is. Now, talk to us. We had a, a neat push card uh, that we were handing out to a lot of people that the, the top five reasons and maybe I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have the card in front of you exactly, but I'm sure you, you, you probably remember these things. But the top five reasons that conservatives uh, have said that they're concerned about the death penalty. Let's go kind of through these one one through five. And again, I want to give out the number 451-1040. Um, if you have a comment uh, about this new group or in support or maybe you have some challenges, we'd love to hear from you. So give us a call at 451-1040. Anyway, uh, Heather, let's go through the top five reasons conservatives are concerned about the death penalty. Absolutely. Well, as I said, you know, the number one reason is the fact that the death penalty is an, a wasteful and expensive government program. You know, every cost study ever conducted has shown that a death penalty system is far more expensive than a system of life without parole. So that's, that's our top reason and probably the one that gained most traction when we were talking with folks at CPAC. Okay, that seems um, counterintuitive. But, Let me interrupt you. How, how is it that uh, the, the death penalty, and, you know, most people think, well, you know, we, we go through the appeals process and then we end up executing a, a person and then we don't have to pay for them anymore. Uh, versus life in prison, say someone's 40 years old and, and they're convicted of a first-degree murder several times over and they get life in prison and conceivably they could live another 35, 40, or even 50 years, it strikes me that it would be way more expensive uh, to put them in prison for the rest of their lives than actually to execute them. Explain that. Sure, and, and that's what most people think, and that's why it's, it's important for us to talk about this because, um, as I said, you know, every cost study ever conducted has shown just the opposite of that, and the biggest reason is because of the trial process. When a prosecutor decides to seek the death penalty um, in a murder case, there are automatically two trials instead of one, and that's the case in every state. So there's one that determines guilt or innocence, and then there's another um, that is strictly about the sentencing phase to determine whether or not this person is going to be executed. So as you can imagine, trials are expensive, and two trials are even more expensive. And, and a lot of the time, we're not only paying for the prosecution, but we end up paying for the defense as well. And then, you know, we have an appeals process, as you said, um, that goes on for decades. And, um, and but that process is necessary because we, we obviously don't want to execute innocent people. Mm -hmm. So it ends up just being a really extremely expensive process. I see. So you're you're talking maybe millions of dollars, actually. Absolutely. And yeah, in definitely. in terms of of uh, the, the same conviction and putting someone in prison for life, you may be looking at thirty five, forty thousand dollars per year. That's and right. It's, times, it's a significant difference. Yeah. So that is huge. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah. it's it's difficult for me as a Catholic on on this program to get into you know arguing the issue on a monetary value, but I mean sure. for for a lot of conservatives, I think that might be an issue they might force them to reconsider the issue. It makes me a bit queasy. I don't like to, to talk about human life in terms of dollars, but, hey, it's it's, it's a fact, and it's something that, that people ought to consider if they're going to be fiscally conservative. Um, all right, the other big one is the risk of executing an okay. innocent person. Talk about that a bit. Absolutely, yes. So so we know that that is a reality. There have been over 140 people who've been exonerated, who were wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death, so for crimes that they had nothing to do with. Since 1976, so that's that's a large number, and a lot of folks are shocked that you know people. This can happen to people in in the USA, and, and it does. And you know, some of these folks had no criminal backgrounds whatsoever, and found themselves ending up on death row. So it can certainly happen to anyone, and that's that's quite scary. I think anybody who's worked either in or around government that should not be surprising. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, that's why I think a lot of what, what you might consider to be people that are more engaged in conservative politics are probably more sympathetic to this idea of, of abolishing the death penalty to those who aren't. Uh, because enough of us have worked inside of these uh, government bureaucracies to understand that the corruption, the inefficiencies, and, and, and the, the, frankly, the incompetence uh, is, it kind of extends throughout the system to a certain degree, and it certainly isn't. Uh, there, there's no isolation in the criminal justice system that makes that system pure. Uh -huh. 
absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah and this, this was an argument I found to be pretty effective. I, I don't know, you know, if a conservative wants to talk about limited government in terms of, you know, public education, uh, entitlement programs, uh, even the military. I don't know how you can say that you believe in limited government if you're willing to give the judicial, the criminal justice system, the unlimited license to, to actually execute a man. It, it, right. it kind of undermines the whole principle of limited government, doesn't it? Exactly, yes. And that's why we have we have found unbelievable support from libertarian folks, from Tea Party folks. I mean, if, if, we, aren't, we, if we aren't able to trust our government to get the, the post office done well, then, then who's to say that we can trust our government to carry out a sentence of life and death and right. to carry it out well, and that's a problem. And, and once we've granted the state that kind of license to to find them, you know, to have the cert- certitude of guilt or innocence, number one, and then number two, to actually exact the punishment of death, I, I really don't know on which bedrock we we put the flag of limited government. I don't, I don't know how you can. Um, so I that's agree with you. yeah, that's something for people to consider. Now, another thing I want to talk about is is I've talked with others. You know, they, they say, well, now we have DNA evidence. So, you know, as long as the DNA evidence shows conclusively that a person, you know, is guilty, then I'm fine with it. But uh, is this kind of CSI mentality? But, you know, and, and, and that's a problem because DNA is really only available in, in less than 10% of capital cases. Right. So unlike CSI, we're right. dealing with cases where DNA is often not available. And, and even when DNA is available, we have to remember who, who are the folks that are handling that DNA. They're human beings. And so mistakes are made even when DNA is available. And I've heard of, of many of those cases where, um, you know, sometimes mistakenly the, the person, you know, ha- has an error with the result. And so that's a problem as well. DNA is, has been very helpful in our criminal justice system, but it does not guarantee that we get it right every time. No, it certainly doesn't. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think this is a, it's kind of a, regrettably, some of the popular culture and even, I think, what I like to call scientism which is this ideology of, you know, science being infallible and science right. doing way more than it actually does. I think it's kind of uh, infiltrated the minds of the public to where we think that we're able to just do some 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 computerized testing of DNA and we can immediately find out uh yeah, this person is guilty or not. And you know, another thing that I found interesting, uh, talk about some of these um confessions. And I was kind of shocked at the number of false confessions uh, that are out there because why, why does that happen? Right. Well, um, you know, oftentimes the death penalty is used as as a tool with prosecutors um, where they, you know, they are trying to get a plea bargain and so they threaten folks with the death penalty and they say, you know, we're we're going to go for the death penalty unless you plead guilty. And and what has happened across our country is that folks have pled guilty to crimes that they didn't commit, and and that's a real problem. And I don't know about you, but I can understand that if someone was oh, threatening. Sure. My life, you know, I, I would say I would say a lot of things, um, and so that's that's a, a big problem, and it it has happened, believe it or not, across the country. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this group called uh, the Innocence Project, uh, we've mm-hmm. actually had them on the program here. They've actually uh, exonerated a number of people who had made false confessions, but later, mm-hmm. uh, the DNA that they found actually wasn't theirs, and they were totally exonerated. So, right. it's right. a big issue, um, and of course, I've been pretty vocal on my program. I, I'm, I'm I'm largely opposed to the death penalty. I mean, we can start talking about some hard cases, uh, but I, I really don't think it's a good idea to talk about exception cases and hard cases when we're talking about public policy. Um, uh-huh. So, all right. Now, another thing that I found interesting, uh, the whole idea of, of the death penalty and how it fails victims' family. We all would think, well, you know, if my daughter were, were killed, I would definitely want the death penalty and so forth and so on. But that's not been the case, has it? That's right, and we talked about the appeals process that goes on for decades, and, and for good reason, but, but you can imagine being a family member in that case and, and being promised that this, this person is going to be executed and that you're going to feel closure at the end of this, only to find that this process goes on forever. Um, and oftentimes the person isn't even executed. I mean, we're finding that across the country, that the person might end up serving life without parole anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's a very harmful process for victims, family members. They have to relive the trauma over and over again. You know, the, the person sort of becomes a celebrity sometimes, right. the person who's on death row. Um, whereas with, with a sentence of life without parole, the sentence is done, it is over, and these people are finding that they're able to start to move on with their lives. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I think uh, even some of the – I've watched over the last uh, 10 or 15 years some of these people we've seen on cable news uh, who were convicted 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago. And right. they're still on death row and there's still all kinds of legal processes. And, boy, you talk about picking out a scab. Um, right. You know, that that's it. Um I do want to address the next topic, and I'm going to give you a bit of a challenge here uh, because this is something I've I've kind of challenged uh, some people here in Kentucky on. The death penalty doesn't keep us safe. Now, you know, we can have this argument over deterrence, and I want to I want to give you the floor there because I agree with you. I I don't think it's a deterrence in the sense that many people agree with. So, I want you to talk a, a little bit about how the death penalty really doesn't deter other people from killing people. Sure. Well, I mean, we're looking at a lot of states that have the death penalty on their books but, but don't use it very frequently. Or if, if they do sentence people to death, as we said before, you know, it, it's taking decades to actually carry out that execution. So, so folks, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a real deterrent that we can hold up to folks because, you know, like I said, a lot of states aren't using it. I mean, in, in my talking with members of law enforcement, I've also found that, um, that they don't believe it's a deterrent either because, most of these crimes that are committed are crimes of passion. Mm-hmm. And so the, the person isn't thinking logically or rationally about what the consequences will be. Um, you know, this person is, is unfortunately acting out and, and committing a crime of passion. We mm-hmm. also know that, you know, states that don't have the death penalty, um, you know, their their crime rates are lower than states that do have the death penalty. So there have been studies on that showing that, you know, that the death penalty just really isn't a real deterrent. Mm-hmm. Now, what what about these issues where we hear uh, oftentimes that someone is convicted of a very heinous murder crime and sentenced to, you know, 30, 40, 50, or even life in prison and due to all kinds of the, the same corruption in the judicial system that, that would that would challenge us not to support the death penalty. But by the same token, that same corruption can also end in... Uh, criminals who really have done heinous things and through the sense of justice and the sense of protecting society should not be getting out of prison in in any reasonable amount of time but we hear of these cases where people are serving seven to ten years and then being let out is that a legitimate argument for the death penalty or not i mean that's a problem and i think you know our criminal justice system is is broken altogether and i think you know, when we also when we talk about public safety, we can talk about a lack of resources and the fact that you know, again, law enforcement folks that I've talked to have said, you know, I would rather rather than having the death penalty, I would rather have more officers on the street or you know better better training, better facilities, better quit, equipment, and and you know, hopefully, if our if our criminal justice system, if we could start to fix some of these problems and fund our criminal justice system in a different way, maybe some of the problems that you're talking about, Mike, wouldn't happen mm-hmm. either. And I, and I think that's right. And I think the the answer is not let's let's uh, continue with the death penalty. I think the answer is hey, let's let's fix those problems. That's right. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, but you know, that's you know, even Pope John Paul II in the Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about you know, if there is a case where someone can't be restrained from killing others, then of course, you know, the death penalty may be warranted. But his point was, in a civilized society with the, the modern means of the penal justice system, we really can restrain those people from, from killing okay. again, and therefore we should take that limited. Uh, view of uh, of our of our state and say you, you know you're just not going to execute people that's that's a that's a power we're not going to grant to the state um now i want to go over some of these uh there are a number of conservatives uh that have really expressed interest in taking another look at the death penalty uh, jay seculo i think my audience all knows jay seculo has had some uh, very powerful things to say about the death penalty Brent Bozell, who we were hoping to meet with, but uh, he got detained there at CPAC and we couldn't uh, see him. Uh, Even Senator Rand Paul uh, has some comments. But again, I want to give out the website. It's called Concerned, I'm sorry, Uh, boy, that's a long website, conservativesconcerned.org. All one word, no spaces, conservativesconcerned.org. And if you have a comment or a question and you'd like to give us a buzz, give us a call at 451-1040. I was hoping this would generate a lot of phone calls, but I'm hoping that maybe uh, my my listeners are actually in agreement with us here, Heather. So maybe they're not they're not giving us a buzz. Uh, Rick Santorum has expressed concerns. Uh, Edward Crane, founder of the Cato Institute, Bill O'Reilly, 
so this notion that conservatism is somehow wedded to the death penalty, I think, is is maybe not quite right. That's right. Um, Absolutely. Tell us a little bit more about uh, conservatives concerned, uh, some of the other events that you guys are going to be tr- participating in in the, in the next uh, couple of months. Sure. Yes. Um, well, as you said, CPAC was our big debut, um, and we, we had a great response there, and we're, we're very well, well received. We're also going to be at the um, Young Americans for Liberty Conference in Kansas that's coming up, and also the Republican Liberty Caucus in Austin, Texas. And so those are, those are just two that are coming up in the next couple of months that we're really excited about. But we are um, looking forward to other opportunities down the road. We're excited to go back to CPAC next year, hoping that we can put a panel together to generate more dialogue about this issue. But um, we're just beginning, and, and we've, we're very excited about what the future holds for us and have been very well received. I, I agree. Um, in fact, I, I, I think using the word stunned would not be an, an exaggeration because I just uh, was kind of overwhelmed at, at the uh, sympathetic reception we had there at CPAC. Um, yeah. You know, and that's that's kind of the hardcore of the Republican Party there. So it's it's not even, uh, you know, the, the more, quote, moderate people who aren't engaged in, in the political process as we were. And then Mark Hayden, he's, uh, he's the associate there. He was also helping out with a lot of the administration, and he comes to you guys from the National Rifle Association. That's right. That's right. And, and folks might not know this, but David Keene, who is the former chair of the American Conservative Union and currently the president of the NRA, is opposed to the death penalty as well, um, for reasons that you talked about before, about limited Mm -hmm. government, um, and and because he's very concerned about innocent people being wrongfully convicted. So, um, so yes, we definitely have folks at the NRA who are on our side, which is shocking to some, Mm -hmm. but, um, but it makes sense. It does make sense, and I'll tell you, as as a conservative, uh, and you know, my my main work, of course, is with Kentucky Right to Life, and and that's a that's a very big passion of mine is protecting the unborn. I kind of had rejected this idea of being against the death penalty was consistent with being pro life because my my view had always been, well, you know, life is so valuable that any system of justice that determines a man's guilty of taking an innocent life ought to be able to take that person's life, and I, I held that view for a number of years. But I really can no longer hold that view for a number of reasons, uh, theological and otherwise. But really, if you want to boil it down to a practical matter, I think it's awfully hard to argue as a conservative that we really need to limit the role of government because they do so many things so poorly and there are so few things that the, that the, that the government can actually do well. I, I don't know how you can actually make an argument as a conservative that the death penalty fits inside the umbrella of conservatism. It strikes me that it's much more... Uh, along the lines of of what I consider now the the liberal Democratic Party, which means basically we're we're going to to kill innocent human lives to solve a greater problem, whether it be abortion or human cloning or even some of the health care rationing we're seeing now in in the Obamacare law. Um, so it strikes me that this really is something that I think the conservative party would would go a long way, the Republican Party would go a long way in really uh, solidifying a consistent message of limited government and the sanctity of human life. So if you're a caller out there and you want to challenge me, I'd love a phone call, 451-1040. Give us a call and share your thoughts. Meantime, uh, let's uh, talk. Where can people get, uh, get in touch with you, Heather? Yes. Well, as you said, they can go to our website at conservativesconcerned.org. You can also send us an email at info at conservatives concern.org and we would love to chat with you if, if you want to sign up on our list you can do that um, on our website or you can email us as well and and as I said we're a new group we're we're just trying to build a base and and gather folks who are interested but um, we're excited about this and um, you know we really feel like the tide is turning in this country as far as conservatives go you know there are so many folks who are on board with us and so we would love if you are like-minded, we'd love for you to join us. Excellent, absolutely. Um, there's there are a few on your website. You have some real stories. Do you can you are you able to talk to us a little bit about Jennifer Thompson's story? Sure. You know, I have had the complete honor and privilege of working with Jennifer Thompson. Um, she came to Montana a couple of times while I was working for the Montana Abolition Coalition, and and her story. If you if you haven't heard it, it's an incredible one. She's actually written a book called Picking Cotton, and I would I would put a little plug in for that too and sure. recommend that. But but to give a brief version of her story, um, she was a young woman living in North Carolina. I believe she was in college, um, 
and she was brutally raped um, in her home. And she um, was far smarter than I could have ever been. Um, she memorized you know, her rapist's face and, and his eyebrows and, you know, his height and all of these things because she was determined to survive this rape mm-hmm. and she was determined that she was going to be able to identify this man and that he was going to pay for this crime. Wow. So, um, so she, she did, she survived. She was raped at knife point. Um, she survived that traumatic event and then she did, she identified this man and was, you know, and he was convicted and he was, you know, sent to prison. And then um, it was found later that she can, she identified the wrong man, um, even though she was completely certain. The man that she identified, his name was Ronald Cotton, hence the book titled Picking Cotton. Oh, wow. Um, but, but she, in fact, had misidentified, and this man had spent 11 years in prison for a rape that he did not commit, even though she was absolutely certain that she had picked the right person. And, and the story is amazing because she went on to meet Ronald Cotton because she wanted to apologize to him and ask for his forgiveness. Um, and he did forgive her, and they are very close friends, wow. and they actually go around and speak together across the country, and it's really quite something. That is to, a very, that, to, that's a great story yeah, of redemption and forgiveness, it is. isn't it? It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think uh, regrettably, or maybe not regrettably, maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but I think we're going to be hearing more and more of these kinds of stories as, um, you know, we, we learn that we've, you know, just basically every element of our of our state anybody who's worked at at a level of lobbying or whatever we understand that there are a lot of motivations involved and we are a fallen uh, human life i mean we have a tendency towards sin and corruption and i think the more powerful we get the more difficult it is to resist those temptations and i think once you get to the level of uh, prosecuting attorneys and and these major capital cases i just think there are too many um too many competing factors other than getting at the truth. And so someone might argue, well, then why are you arguing at all for any kind of a punishment? Well, we have to have some kind of criminal justice system, and I think we have to do the best we can do, but I think it's a reasonable argument to say, look, you know, in the case of a capital murder charge and you have a conviction, I think we have to have the humility to pull back a little bit and say, you know, we've got a lot of problems uh, w- with our own state. We we generally don't do a lot very well in, in governmental services. Anybody who's been to the DMV or the post office ought to be able to see uh-huh. this and now the health care. So let's pull back and let's limit the power of the state. Uh, and I just think that's a, a totally reasonable argument, and I don't know how anybody could actually muster an argument the other way. So I am on right. board, Heather, and uh, I appreciate your group very much, and I wish yeah. uh, concerned – uh, conservativesconcern.org all the all the luck in the world i hope you guys get more and more uh support and i think you will um especially after cpac i, I was really really very touched by the whole response yes well thank you so much mike and, and again we can't thank you enough for coming along with us and um and talking with folks on our behalf and thank you so much for having me today. absolutely it's been, it's been wonderful to talk with you well great and get back get back home to grace because uh yes <laughs> that's five months old that's a long haul and congratulations on the marriage and the new baby by the way thank you absolutely thank you. I appreciate it thanks very much uh well vince uh, come on you're the curmudgeon of the station well actually we're both we're kind of dual curmudgeons but it, can you can you muster an argument in favor of the death go for it in favor of the death penalty yes well i'm not the one who's ox is good so Yes, uh, there we go. That's much better. I'm not the one whose ox is gored, but I, I can see circumstances where somebody might be really, really mad. Um, of course. And I'm talking public policy. I'm not talking, you know. Uh, well, there are circumstances where you, you simply can't safely hold a prisoner. Somebody who's determined to kill a guard and kill other prisoners or whatever, sometimes, you know, it's pretty tough how you're going to keep them. And uh, hmm. is the risk to other people really worth the... Uh, um, effort to save the life when someone is absolutely committed to any kind of destruction they can they can uh, perpetrate. Well, you know, you're getting close to a case where it yeah. might be necessary. Yeah. Well, um, you're talking but, here about you know, the case where someone does, breaks into your home at 2 in the morning is intent on killing your family. Can you shoot them? I don't think you have to wait to find out their intent. <laughs> if they break in, it's sort of manifest. <laughs> well, in, yes, yes. In law enforcement, they call that jeopardy. Right, but I think that would be under the... Under the, under the uh, the, the whole Catholic catechism in this regard, in, in your case, is well taken. I, I don't think anybody has an argument there. I'm talking about those who would argue that the state has a role in executing people for the purpose of redress to the community. 
Yeah, I think at least for the Catholics, that argument has been obviated by Evangelium Vitae and the changes in the Catechism. So, yeah, <laughs> retribution is not a a uh, sufficient motive to take a life. I agree. Good segment. And uh, interesting, we didn't have any callers, so I'm hoping that's a sign that more people agree than disagree. So uh, we're going to chat about a couple of other issues right here in the state on the other side of the break. Stay with us.